This presentation is from The Church of Jesus Christ, Zion's Branch, located in Independence, Missouri. The sermon message is brought by Elder Clay Barber and is titled, Overcoming the Things of Babylon. I was reading in the book of Revelation last night, and I don't know why I was drawn there, but I was drawn to the area where Babylon is fallen. It's in chapter 18 of Revelations. For Babylon to fall is a really good thing in the book of Revelations. I was reading it last night and I started wondering, why is it always Babylon? You ever wonder that? Why is it Babylon? What are they bad about? I started thinking about it. You know, I've got these history books and things like that. I like history. It helps me understand what the time frame was, what was going on in the rest of the world. It helps give the scriptures some context. And I went back and I read some in this history book about Babylon. And do you know that Babylon was also associated with the Tower of Babel? Oh, that's kind of interesting. That was a good time in the scriptures, wasn't it? Yeah? Everybody that gathered around the Tower of Babel, building this thing up to God, thinking that we men are going to reach up to God with something that we build and he's going to recognize us and lift us up because we've done such a wonderful thing. It didn't turn out too well, did it? It's a symbol of the pride that men have that they would think more of themselves than they ought to think. And as time went on, Isaiah talks about the Assyrians and how the northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes that were in the north, they get taken away. But he also talks a little bit about Babylon because Babylon was still in existence at that time and it was a rising power. And it was in Jeremiah's time that Babylon became the power. When Billy read about Lehi's vision this morning, about Jerusalem being destroyed and taken into captivity, Babylon's the one that did that. Remember King Nebuchadnezzar? Remember hearing about him? Well, he's the guy that came in uh, after the king of Judah decided not to pay his taxes. He came in not once, but twice. First time he whooped up on Judah and Jerusalem and said, now they'll pay their taxes, doggone it. And guess what? The king of Judah listened to the Egyptians, which were also trying to be the power at the time. And guess what he did again? He didn't pay the taxes. Didn't pay the thing to Babylon. And Babylon comes marching over with King Nebuchadnezzar and destroys Jerusalem, takes all of the stuff out of the temple and takes it back to Babylon. So it's a symbol when John talks about Babylon in the book of Revelations, it's a symbol for the things that have been bad that Israel gets themselves involved with, and they get involved not only with the things that Babylon had a lot of wealth back then, and they went and took all of Israel's wealth with them, but they went and brought back, once they were in Babylon, they came back under the Medes and the Persians and they built up the temple and stuff. But guess what they brought back with them? Idols and gods and all kinds of other stuff from Babylon. Well, that wasn't the first time that they would brought idols and gods and other stuff in from other places. The Philistines had them and we read about those in the book of Samuel, right? They brought in those gods and that type of thing. When the Assyrians took people away, they brought in those gods. When they came out of Egypt, they said, oh, that I wish we were back with those gods, right? Over and over and over again, God's covenant people goes lusting after things that are outside in the world. And when John talks about Babylon and about that great harlot, that is clothed in all of the purples and golds and reds and you know all the things that are symbols of power and wealth and might and things of this world that people lust after. And he says that's associated with this great and abominable church. 
the ones that would take people away from the message of the gospel, the one that would take people away from the understanding of the truth of the covenant that God made with the house of Israel, the one that would take people away from understanding that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of that covenant, that he came to earth because God promised Abraham and Isaac and Jacob that in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, and that Jesus Christ would come through that covenant. And Babylon is a symbol, and that great and abominable church is a symbol for all the things of the world that take us away from that covenant, that take us away from the knowledge and understanding of God and of Jesus Christ, and about the simple, easy things that we can do to become part of that covenant by being baptized by one having authority and by having hands laid on us for the gift of the Holy Spirit by one having authority, by recognizing that there are those with authority. This Babylon that John talks about is equated with that great whore, the one that gets us to forget about our covenants and go off into the world and do things that take us away. On her forehead was written, Mystery, Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. It's not any one church or any one thing that John uses as this symbol, but it's anything and everything that would take us away from the message of the gospel, take us away from the truth, take us away from the ability to come back into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. There are just all kinds of churches and congregations and beliefs and things like that that would be willing to take us away. Christianity itself is part of that harlot. So is Islam, so is Hinduism, so is Buddhism, so is all of the things that are not truth and are not lined up with the message of the truth. People don't like to think of the church, the Christian church, as being bound up in that symbol. But it is. It's something that when John gives this symbol, he's telling us, look out for the things of the world. Look out for the things that can take you away from the message of the gospel. Look out for those things. Be careful. Remember how the book of Revelation starts? John's talking to the seven churches. Well, all seven of those churches are supposed to be congregations of Christianity scattered throughout various areas around Jerusalem and Israel. Scattered around those areas, having the message of the gospel taken to them, and they've somehow made mistakes with it. They've gone and strayed off of the truth that was given to them. So for us not to include Christianity in that great and abominable church, would be a mistake. What we need to look at is also what happens. When I started reading chapter 18, it says at the very start of it, after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication and the kings of the earth, the kings being those that are the political leaders, those that are the leaders of the world, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Ronnie taught us at one time that those merchants are the priesthood, priesthood of the churches. 
And I think about it, you read that verse and you say, oh, isn't that interesting? You got political leaders and religious leaders often meeting together. How many presidents have you seen with Billy Graham or with the Pope or with some other religious figure, mega church leaders that are very influential in bringing votes to a particular political candidate? And they're mixed up together, drinking the Kool-Aid together, right? <laughs> they're mixed up together, and they like what one another is saying, and it's like, well, yeah, let's have some more of that. Let's have these ideas of how we'll collaborate on things, and we'll get stuff done, and all kinds of good things will happen. And yet, when you look at what really happens out of all of their summits and their meetings together, you get a lot of words and a lot of promises and a lot of good feelings that happen out of it. And then what happens? It doesn't happen. There's this big increase in the news about this person and that person met together and, oh, look at all the things they promised. And then you get the real things that happen. It just kind of rolls off and nothing ever comes out of it. But they're there together. They're talking to one another. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. It's a voice of warning to us not to get involved with that kind of thing. Be skeptical of that type of stuff. Be careful of it. Match it up with what the scriptures really say and don't get caught up with the things of the world. It says, for her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Remember, there's a judgment coming. And if you get mixed up with that kind of stuff, and you get, you get overcome by it, and you succumb to it, which is exactly what John, at the very beginning of Revelations, talked about to the seven churches, is about not being overcome by things of the world, right? Right? But if you or I get mixed up with it and we get overcome by it, then we risk our salvation. We risk losing it. The message of the angel was, Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. Double unto her double? Render twofold. Give her twice back what she has given to the world. In the cup which she hath filled, fill her to double. Let it overflow. She's going to get something, this Babylon, the great, this mystery of all the world, this great and abominable church is going to get something, and God's not going to be giving good stuff. Because for all of the junk that it has produced, he's going to give back double, it says. You want to be part of that? Great. Be careful. Be careful. How much she hath glorified herself and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. I don't have any qualms about who I am. As a matter of fact, I'm proud of it. I'm glad for who I am. I'm glad for what I have built up and what I have accomplished. I don't care whether it is in line with the gospel or not. And that's where we have to be very careful. We do need to care about that. We do need to be assessing all of the things that go on around us in the world and looking at them with an eye that says, how does that line up with the gospel? How does that make me compare with the gospel if I get involved with those kind of things. It says, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. In one day. It's another symbol, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that things will happen in one day, although it could. God's that powerful, those things could happen in one day, in my opinion. But 
Think about what happens about these religious leaders that they build themselves up and then they get involved with stuff and then some little leak comes out that is, this is kind of sketchy. This kind of thing that you're involved with isn't really on the up and up, is it? And look how they start backing off of things and then look how fast they fall from favor, right? <laughs> oh, back off, buddy. Hey. Yeah, I didn't really know you that well. I may have had my arm around you, but it was only for a photo. You know, that was it. It wasn't for anything else. And that's what happens with the world, right? Well, why should we be involved with that kind of stuff? Why should we get close to that kind of stuff? Why should we be near it? Then we'd be the one trying to wipe off the slime that got on us as we had our arm around the favored religious leader of the day. Do you want that? No, none of us want that. It's better that we are clean and we're not involved with that kind of stuff to begin with. It just goes on and on about all the bad things that happened to her. But what's good is you get to chapter 20 and 21 where there's this war. Jesus Christ comes and there's this wonderful thing that happens, which is the gathering of those who have been faithful and those that have not been overcome and those that are adhering to the covenant and those that haven't been involved with Babylon. And that's what we're about, not being involved with all the rest of the world. I don't think we care so much what happens with the rest of the churches of the world. There was a time when we looked very carefully at all that was going on with the restoration and being right up on all the little details about what was going on with them. I don't want to be insular. I don't want to be, we're it and we're only it. That's not the case. But I don't really care which restoration branch does this, that, and the other thing. I don't really care what goes on at the community of Christ or the Mormons or whatever. You know, it doesn't affect me anymore. It doesn't affect you anymore as far as influencing what it is that we believe or what it is that we study or what it is that we do in our lives. It's not that important. What's important is for us to try to engage anyone that will hear this message, anyone that will be with us, anyone that will be part of taking and stripping away the things of the world, the things of our old beliefs that don't matter, and finding the truthfulness of the gospel. Those are the ones that Jesus Christ is coming back for. Those are the ones that we need to be looking for and uh, trying to be ourselves. If we're not, then when Jesus comes back, we may be in the boat with the Babylon, the whore of all the earth, trying to find out how do we get back in here. As Billy mentioned last week with his message about what do you do with the ten virgins, right? You want to be of the five wise or you want to be of the five foolish virgins where you got to come and you got to say, hey, give me some of your oil. Give me some of your preparation. And it's like, I don't know if I got enough myself. I can't give to you. I need to be prepared myself. And when the time came to go into the bridegroom chamber, they come and they knock and the answer was, sorry. You didn't come on time, and you didn't come with what you needed, and so you're left out. The rest of Revelation's about how this new Jerusalem comes down and what a wonderful place it is, and that's where we want to be. That's what the goal is, and everybody in the world thinks that they're going to get there, but there's this judgment that happens that says in chapter 20, verse 13, and they were judged every man according to their works. John's message was, don't get involved with Babylon. Don't get caught up in the things of the world. Look to the things that you ought to be doing and don't get involved with breaking the covenant. 
Make sure that you adhere to that covenant. Make sure that it's something that's important to you. Make sure that you look at it in the way that it's supposed to be looked at as the most important thing that we do with our lives. There is nothing else more important. There's nothing more important than this gospel. There are times that I let it slip, like Billy talked about some this morning. We fall down a rung and we got to get back up. But overall, I think we do pretty good. And I'm very, very happy to be part of this church. Very, very happy to be part of the House of Israel. To be part of the restored church that has the word of God, that has the ability to bring others unto the truth, to be the shining light that this world needs. We have to be careful how we burn that light. Can't be like a firecracker and you use up everything and then you got nothing left, do you? We got to be like that candle that's made with the right combination of stuff that it burns long and it burns slow and it burns bright. That's the enduring to the end. It burns bright so that others can see it. It burns bright so that when others have questions about the gospel, they know that you've got answers, that you've got a way to overcome these things of Babylon and to come into the kingdom of God, be accepted into that kingdom when Jesus Christ returns. To be accepted into that new Jerusalem that has the 12 gates with the 12 tribes of Israel above it, above each gate. I appreciated the opportunity to be with you this morning and to speak. I appreciate Clay's message this morning, his sermon. Appreciate you being here. You know, he talks about falling short or getting out of the way, coming up short of the mark or getting off the path. You know, it tells us the way is straight and it's narrow. Few there be that find it. But, you know, when you fall off of the path or when anyone out in the world falls below the mark, and let's say they want to get back to the path or to the mark, how do they know when they've hit it? If there is no path... If there is no mark, if there is no standard, then you never fall short, do you, in your own mind? My point is, is there has to be a standard. And the standard has to be explained so that we all know when we've fallen short of the mark, when we all know that we've come below the standard. And that's what needs to happen in the world of Christianity, is the standard needs to be taught that there is a straight and narrow way and people need to be taught that way and shown that they too can achieve that. And unfortunately, if there's no standard, you don't know when you've fallen short. And I doubt very seriously, very many people go above it, do you? But to find that standard is what we seek. And I thank the Lord for his word. I thank him that he helps us to see that there is a standard, that there is a way whereby we might attain those things that God has for us. I hope that one day our faith becomes knowledge. And I think in many ways it should have. Sometimes maybe we need to have it pointed out of the things that we know. But I thank Clay very much for being open to the Spirit today. I thank him for his word. I thank you for putting forth the effort once more to get up and come to church. It not only will help you, but it means something to all of us. But it really helps to look around and see that there's someone else, that someone else feels that they should be here. Maybe not just for their good, but maybe it helps me. Maybe it helps someone else. But I thank you for putting forth the effort to be here, that we can try to ask God's Spirit in unity to be among us. Thank you for letting us share this message with you, a message dedicated to the truth found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have other messages available on YouTube and at our website. Check back with us often as we add more messages. Remember, truth is essential to your salvation. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is death. Seek the truth. 
Be sure to understand why you believe what you believe. Thank you.